How do you know this? That's what I do. I drink and I know things. Storytelling through TV is in something of a golden age. Oh, no doubt. It has ambitious stories, deep ideas, and complex characters. I am the danger. All told to audiences that aren't in it for just mindless entertainment, but for the opportunity to think and to learn. Woo! Who? The current golden age of TV has little in common with blockbuster movies that are often focused only on spectacle, on violence and destruction. Nor is it like it's simple, formulaic forerunners, where the heroes always do the right thing and the villains are pure evil. In many ways, great TV owes much more to a form of storytelling that had its own golden age 2,400 years ago. Greek drama. Greek drama originated from ancient rituals surrounding the god Dionysus. These took the form of dithyrams, where a chorus would sing and dance to religious hymns. Then, one day in the 6th century BCE, Thespis, one of the singers, rather than dance along with the rest of the chorus, began to individually act out parts of the story, and from here, drama was born. In fact, even though Thespis lived 2,500 years ago, his name still lives on through the modern word thespian which means actor. From this point on, Greek drama became increasingly sophisticated. What began as a small ritual grew into a massive event. Theatres were built to accommodate up to 15,000 spectators. Playwrights would submit and perform competing plays, each adding more actors who began to speak to each other using dialogue. Actors wore masks, crafted and painted along with costumes to depict very different characters. Some of these characters were even <gasps> women. Women weren't allowed to perform these roles, of course, which were for the exclusively male actors, but women were allowed to attend and watch the plays. In the 5th century BCE, the Greeks added a scene, or scene building. What started from a tent, rumoured to have been stolen from the Persian king Xerxes, grew into a wooden building, and eventually, an elaborate stone facade, with many entrances and exits. It even had a second story, from where ghosts and gods could emerge. Even cranes were added to the stage, through which actors could play gods descending from the heavens, or on which ridiculous characters could be hoisted above the crowd. Just as stagecraft developed, so too did the complexity of the stories and characters. And plays began to diverge into two major forms, tragedy and comedy. So what's tragedy? Tragedy originally meant goat song, possibly referring to the prizes for which the first playwrights competed. But over the years it came to mean a specific type of play that deals with the most serious of issues in the most serious of ways. Tragedy doesn't necessarily mean sad, although tragedies often are. Instead, tragedies are grim and deep and deal with eternal issues that beset humanity, no matter the age in which they live. Interesting tragic characters aren't just stereotypes. They're not simply good or bad, but have complicated intentions, who change over time. They're shaped by situations in which they find themselves, and their own choices. Perhaps, most importantly, even though some of these characters can do horrible things, we still empathise with them. We recognise their humanity, and are driven to understand them. Greek tragic characters were complicated too, and the willingness of playwrights like Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides to explore them speaks to how sophisticated the Greeks could be. In fact, after the Persians invaded Greece in the early 5th century and sacked Athens, Aeschylus, who actually fought in the battles against the invaders, had all of the motivation in the world to portray them as simple, unfeeling monsters. Instead, he wrote a play called The Persians, in which the invading Emperor Xerxes and his mother are portrayed in a sympathetic way, subject to the same fears as any hero, the same complicated reasons for acting, and the same regrets. Greek tragedies often dealt with the idea of fate, and how much ability humans have to avoid or change it. They had concepts like hubris, where even the best heroes can act arrogantly or thoughtlessly, set in motion events which they can no longer control, 
and eventually pay for their hubris in the most horrific of ways. By ignoring the will of the gods, or even worse, thinking they're better than the gods, they seal their own fate. Sophocles wrote Oedipus the Tyrant. It was the story of a baby boy of whom the oracles said would one day kill his father and marry his mother. His father, seeking to avoid this fate, abandoned the boy in the wild, where he was found and raised by another couple in a different city. Again, as a grown man, the oracles told Oedipus that he would one day kill his father and marry his mother. Now, if he was humble enough to question himself and his origins, he would have found that he was adopted. Instead, he defied the gods and escaped. Unfortunately for everyone involved, he escaped to Thebes, where he unwittingly killed his real father and married his real mother. Instead of escaping his fate, his unwillingness to truly understand the will of the gods made the prediction come true. Eventually, upon finding out what he'd unwittingly done, rather than see the reminders of such a horrific mistake, he gouged out his own eyes in despair. Good TV also tells stories of fate and hubris, although not quite in the same extreme way as Oedipus. Characters don't rebel against gods anymore, but instead try to escape the consequences of other forces, like institutions, social and economic changes, and human nature itself. In trying to escape these forces, characters sow the seeds of their own destruction. They set in motion events that they can't understand, let alone control, and eventually, inescapably, bring about their own undoing. Well, get on with it, mother- It's bleak, it's horrible, but through stories of fate and hubris, we can learn our own limitations. No matter how sophisticated we are economically, scientifically, or culturally, we don't know it all. If we truly wish to solve problems, then we need to display humility in the face of the things that we don't know. If, like the tragic heroes, we overestimate our own abilities, we'll inevitably make costly mistakes, be they economic, political, environmental, or social. All in the game, yo. <laughs> All in the game. <laughs> It's this subtlety that makes tragedy a useful way to explore political and moral ideas. What makes a good system? Is right defined by tradition? Or religion? Or strength? What makes a good leader? Is it okay to kill? And under what circumstances? Is it justified to seek revenge? Should you treat dangerous enemies with compassion? Or should you be merciless? Euripides used tragic plays to explore and criticise the political or moral decisions made by Athens. During the Peloponnesian War, Athens, suspecting that Milos was supporting their enemy, voted to invade the tiny island. Athenian democracy cheered on as soldiers slaughtered all the Melian men and sold their wives and children into slavery. In response, Euripides wrote a play called The Trojan Women, about the mythical women of Troy who had their lives torn apart by invasion, war, and callous invaders who saw themselves as heroes. Such stories were uncomfortable for the Athenians, as the massacre at Milos had happened only months earlier. The play won Euripides' few friends. What then is comedy? Early Greek comedies started out as short skits known as satyr plays. Satyrs were the half-goat, half-man followers of Dionysus, who, between acts in the tragedies, would lighten the mood and make fun of the very serious tragic characters. These weren't classy affairs, and often consisted of slapstick-style humour, as well as fart jokes, and an all-time Greek favourite, phalluses. We can't look down on the Greeks for this style of comedy either. Modern TV employs the same humour. Regardless of how powerful a person is, how dignified, we're all humans. We're all made of the same stuff, and let's face it. No matter how much we may pretend otherwise, farts are pretty funny. Comedy isn't all just burps, bumps, and phalluses, though. Often, humour is used as a way of looking at serious issues, poking fun at the powerful and popular in society. Through exaggeration, irony, and incongruity, comedy can point out hypocrisy, can highlight bad arguments, and offer brutal insights into our own cultural failures. Like ancient Greek tragedies, comedies grew increasingly sophisticated. 
Playwrights like Aristophanes began to use all the tools of tragedy to make fun of Athenian culture, and like good comedians two and a half millennia later, no one escaped Aristophanes' wit. He made fun of populist political leaders in the Knights. He made fun of self-important, power-tripping juries in the Wasps. He even made fun of the philosopher Socrates, portraying him as an aloof and ridiculous charlatan. In his play Lysistrata, the women of Athens and Sparta, tired of war, refuse to sleep with their husbands until they stop fighting each other and make peace. The results are exaggerated, silly, and frankly pretty funny, but there was a serious point. That maybe the fighting between Athens and Sparta was a pointless and destructive exercise. Maybe the Athenians were wrong to deride calls for peace as womanly. Maybe if men could just shut up for a second and listen to women, everyone might be better off. Anyone who appreciates great TV ought to be grateful to the Greeks for pioneering these sorts of stories. But they also should be a little worried. The golden age of Greek drama lasted little more than a century. Later Roman theatre dumped the complex form of storytelling and focused on the bawdy and violent. The depth and complexity of Greek drama wouldn't be seen again for 2,000 years. It took a 17th century playwright to revive it. Shakespeare. This video covered the basics of Greek drama, where it came from and what it looked like. It looked at tragedy and the three great tragedians, Aeschylus, Sophocles and Euripides. It also looked at comedy, satyr plays and the great comedian Aristophanes. Make sure you share this video with anyone who might find it useful and stick around for the questions. Three, two. What was a scheme and Makane? What did the word tragedy originally mean? Who wrote the Persians? Who wrote Oedipus the Tyrant? The Trojan Women was written in response to what event? Name three plays written by Aristophanes.